Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Global Hotspots. The Global Hotspots series is co-sponsored by the Wisconsin Alumni Association, PLATO, and the UW-Madison International Division. So on behalf of all of our sponsors, thank you for joining us today. My name is Christina Zignago, and I am the program coordinator for the Wisconsin Foundation and Alumni Association. Our next Global Hotspots is Friday, April 22nd, for our special Earth Day presentation, Terry Allendorf will be speaking on biodiversity conservation in developing countries, the view from the local communities. The Global Health Institute also has two great events coming up. The first is the Global Health Symposium on March 30th, and then the Women, Wellbeing, and Empowerment on March 16th. For more information, please visit the registration table. Did I say April 16th? Friday, April 15th, sorry for the mistake. <laughs> the date is correct on the flyer. So we hope that you guys will be able, be able to join us at some of these events. And I will now pass the mic over to Rick to introduce today's speaker. Thank Thanks, Christina. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Keller. I'm Associate Dean in the International Division. Uh, Leveraging the assets of a premier global institution, the International Division brings together expertise from across the UW-Madison campus and collaborates to help a wide range of stakeholders advance their global aspirations. The Division is proud to co-sponsor the Global Hotspot Series, which embodies the University's commitment to use our knowledge and skills to inform and improve the lives of people near and far. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Jonathan Patz, whom I count as a colleague and a friend. Jonathan's the director of the Global Health Institute, and in addition, he's professor, a professor and holds the John P. Holton Chair in Health and the Environment, with appointments in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the Department of Population Health Sciences. For 15 years, he served as lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the organization that shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. And I will say, just as a testament to Jonathan's modesty, it takes till about page seven of his CV to actually find that. <laughs> he co-chaired the health expert panel of the U.S. National Assessment on Climate Change, a report mandated by the United States Congress. Dr. Patz has written over 90 peer-reviewed scientific papers, a textbook addressing the health effects of global environmental change, and co-edited the five-volume Encyclopedia of Environmental Health in 2011. Most recently, he co-edited Climate Change and Public Health, uh, which has won at least two awards I know of so far. I'm sure that has to do with the four paragraphs I wrote in that book, but, uh, <laughs> and nothing to do with Jonathan's. Anyway, uh, and he's also leading a massive op open online course, Climate Change Policy and Public Health. He's been invited to brief both houses of Congress and has served on several scientific committees of the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Pat served as founding president of the International Association for Ecology and Health as well. He's board certified in both occupational and environmental medicine, as well as family medicine. He received his medical degree from Case Western Reserve University in 1987, and his Master of Public Health degree uh, in 1992 from Johns Hopkins University, from which institution we managed to steal Jonathan about a decade ago. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Patz. You can take that. Rick, thank you very much for that. Very kind introduction, and um, I hope uh, Rick, I know, recognizes this photograph because this photograph is Notre Dame in Paris, where uh, Rick Keller himself has done work on the killer heat wave that hit Paris and the rest of Europe in 2003. And he has an acclaimed book out as well on the Paris heat wave. The reason I have Paris in this photograph is because that's where the latest UN Framework Convention on Climate Change held its 21st Conference of the Parties, or COP21. And so I'm going to report out a little bit about the good news uh, out of the Paris meeting and tell you why I think there's some golden opportunities and why this is a critical point in time where I think that we are heading to a healthier society if we can get to a clean energy society. Uh, the title used to be called 
road to a healthy, clean energy society, but I decided for alternative transportation uh, reasons to call it path to healthy, clean energy society. And we know that we, we need to get there. We need to get away from fossil fuels because of evidence like this. These, these are showing across the four, four of the best climate centers in the world showing complete agreement that the world is warming. It's warmed almost one centigrade uh, in, the, in the past uh, century. And if you think about news from yesterday, um, this is um, from Associated Press quoting a climate scientist. When I look at the new February 2016 temperatures, I feel like I'm looking at something out of a sci-fi movie. Uh, you know, last year, uh, I'll just show this is, um, you know, looking at February temperatures around the world. You can see how far out of normal these are. Now, we're having one of the strongest El Ninos, and that uh, contributes, but these temperatures are so far out of normal that uh, another climatologist said, welcome to the new normal. And um, last year, 2015, was the hottest year in recorded history. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, uh, from their latest assessment report, you know, these are the projections for where we're going as far as warming temperatures. And on the right, here, on, on, on the left here, this is sort of best case scenario that will warm by one degree centigrade on average by the end of the century. And then on the right is worst case scenario, seven degrees on average warming by the end of the century. Of course, the earth is mostly water. So where people live on land, those temperatures are actually going to be even greater. Which one of these maps do you think we're heading to right now with our current energy policies? The left or the right? The right. the right. In fact, we're going beyond worst case scenario right now as far as the way we're burning fossil fuels. So with this future picture, the United Nations held its 21st Conference of the Parties to really try to take a serious um, look at the issue. And could we turn this around and instead of heading for worst case scenario, shift the direction that we're heading. So I was lucky enough to be one of the faculty members who represented uh, the University of Wisconsin. There were three of us who went uh, to Paris. And um, we actually had live stream video from the meeting. And when we arrived, uh, there were a bunch of these big ice blocks that someone had put in uh, uh, outside of the uh, um, the, the um, uh, where, where did you say, Kim? Anyway, somewhere in Paris. And uh, the, the goal was to see if these ice blocks would last through the two-week meeting. And to be honest, I don't know if they did or not, because it was pretty warm in Paris. This was a historic meeting. 147 heads of state presidents or prime ministers, the heads of state showed up at COP21. That's the highest number to one event ever in history, throughout history. You've never had that many heads of states in one place at one time. So the political will and just, the, just showing up was really important that, that that many heads of state showed up. 183 out of 196 countries that exist, 183 countries did their homework before the meeting, and they, as required by the 20th Conference of the Parties that was negotiated in Lima, Peru, they came up with their intended commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So coming into the meeting, there was already a plan, and that was, had not happened before. The US and China had negotiated to come to the table. Very important, because that hadn't happened 
in the previous conference of the parties to have the, the US and China already committing to reduce fossil fuels was a game changer to, towards more success and, and rationale for other countries to act. This is to show you a few examples of these uh, intended nationally determined contributions to reduce greenhouse gases. You can see Japan, Australia, and the United States committing to reduce by 25 to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. The EU, a little bit higher, 40% reduction. And Ethiopia, where I actually did my sabbatical uh, last year, they committed to 64% reduction below business as usual by 2020. So this is, you know, and, and of course Ethiopia, they're, they're up and coming and they recognize between their hydro and solar and wind power, they don't have to become a fossil fuel dependent society. And so um, very bold, but I think actually quite, quite reasonable and an inspiration to the other countries. This meeting in Paris also brought, a, brought many businesses and philanthropists uh, to the table. This is uh, Bill Gates was there introducing the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, 28 other influential investors. Um, putting billions of dollars on the table for getting to a clean energy um, uh, society to really, uh, they, he promised immediately $3 billion to India towards renewable energy. And businesses spoke out saying, we are ready. We see climate change as a global threat. We are ready and we see the target to get to a low carbon economy. Lots of businesses were there. So that was extremely important. Now, as positive as this meeting was, of course, there is some reason for some skepticism. And we know that there are some issues at international and national levels. And yes, in the United States, we have some problems in Congress. Not much is getting done in Congress. And even if the Paris Agreement, which it's a non-binding agreement to those emission cuts, but it is a binding agreement to review those emission cuts every five years, uh, major uh, important binding commitment to that, that even if you're skeptical to say international and national policies are not gonna happen soon enough, um, I was especially inspired by what is going on at the local level, level. And mayors and urban leaders and regional leaders and, and governors like Governor Jerry Brown from California, they were there talking about the incredible progress being made at the city level. The C40 cities, these are mega cities, enormous cities that are pledging to, uh, through this compact of mayors, uh, and led by Michael Bloomberg, or co-led by Michael Bloomberg, to really say, enough with national politics. We know that a low carbon economy is economical and healthier. We're going there. And these cities around the world are doing amazing things. Uh, I went to one presentation where I learned that Oslo, Norway, is going to ban cars in the inner part of their city. Other, other, other cities are doing the same thing. And you know the experiments from tactical urbanism, where you, you take away the street from cars, you turn it into a walking mall, and ironically, business goes up when the business, small business owners thought it would go down. So th this is happening and very exciting. Whatever the national politi politics is, this, I think, is where things are happening. And I was able to test, test drive one of their, uh, these uh, electric assist bicycles I also rode, they have bike shares in Paris. Uh, they have 6,008 kiosks, bike kiosks. I don't know how many Madison has for B-cycles, but 6,000 kiosks for bike share, and they're introducing these electric assist bikes as well. So the key outcomes from the Conference of the Parties in Paris is that they, they have agreed the, 
to, you know, this is national leaders have agreed to keep temperatures below a target of two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. The two degrees centigrade comes from the United Nations IPCC scientists saying that we're bound to have some warming. The greenhouse gases in the atmosphere now will last for 50 to 100 years. We are going, going to have some warming. But can we level that off and warm just stay below 2 degrees centigrade? Because after 2 degrees, the ecologists and the agronomists and all the impact scientists say, you get above 2 degrees, systems will start to fall apart. Crops will fail. Ecosystems will crash. And it's going to be a, not a nice scenario. Um, so that's the goal is why we're trying to stay below two degrees. And all those commitments that I put up there, uh, a sample of the 183 countries that have committed to reduce their fossil fuel emissions, if we really get to those commitments and reduce, I don't know, on average 40 to 50 percent of, of our fossil fuel emissions, we would stabilize at about 2.7 degrees centigrade. So that's pretty good. It's still not good enough. And there was even a further pledge to try, to endeavor to limit to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So the message out of Paris was crystal clear, ambitious, but an agreed, you know, agreement on that ambition. And this, um, you know, binding commitment to review these, these um, commitments every five years. Also, there was a commitment to establish a, a minimum $100 billion per year fund in the next few couple of years for, a client to, for climate finance to for helping poor countries adapt to climate change and to advance energy technology in poor countries. So these are key things that came out. And this is why, you know, when I saw this headline, I was quite pleased uh, that nations approve landmark climate deal. Now, we know the devil's in the details, and there's a lot of, you know, reasons that it's going to still be difficult, but I think we have made a major advance to have this many leaders agree to this and send a signal to the business community, this is where we're heading, and coal is no longer a good investment. And when you think about it, even conservative investors are wondering, 10 to 15 years from now, do we want to be investing in oil? It might not be economically strategic. Now, my own role in Paris, I'm not a negotiator. I'm not a businessman. I'm, uh, I'm a public health scientist. And Rick was kind enough to uh, mentioned this book that we came out recently. So I was attending some of the, the health venues there, the, the WHO Summit on Climate Change, the Green Hospital Movements, where hospitals are saying, we're treating people and we're trying to reduce illness, but if we're burning a lot of fossil fuel and putting smoke up our incinerators and being non-sustainable, non we may be treating people today and harming people outside of the hospital and future generations. So there's a whole movement in the healthcare sector to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, if you look at sort of, look at the health risks of climate change, I'll just, I give this lecture all the time and I'll just give you like three or four quick illustrations for why climate change is a public health issue. I mean, I've been talking about this for a long time, you know, and the general areas of climate sensitive diseases have not changed. We know that looking on top, you know, the urban heat island effect. We know people die in heat waves. And as Rick Keller has studied the Paris heat wave, you know, 70,000 people dying in 11 days in Europe, that's a public health disaster. So we know that heat kills. But also air pollution, especially ground level smog, ozone pollution, very temperature sensitive. Ragweed pollen and other aero allergens are sensitive to temperature and higher CO2 in the, in the air. And these infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases carried by insects or rodents. You know, a mosquito is a cold-blooded animal. 
So whatever the air temperature of the mosquito is, that's the body temperature of the mosquito. And so the air temperature dictates how fast parasites uh, and viruses will develop in a mosquito. So we know that diseases like dengue fever, West Nile virus, malaria, probably Zika, and I'll show you a slide on that, are really sensitive to climatic changes. And when you think about climate change, and you look over here on the left side, it's not just rising temperatures. It's sea level rise from thermal expansion of salt water and land-based glaciers falling into the ocean, and also hydrologic extremes, extremes of the water cycle. More floods and more droughts. More floods because hot air holds more moisture. So it can, you, you get flooding and droughts, more extremes of the water cycle. Now, if you have more extremes of the water cycle, waterborne diseases, contamination. And if you have droughts, water resources, food supplies, major risks. And on the bottom, mental health and environmental refugees. When you think about rising sea level, droughts, storms, we're talking about mass population displacement. And while it's very difficult to study this thing on the bottom, because it could be bad politics, inflexible government, or it could be extremes uh, in climate or natural resource depletion. Very difficult to study. But I think this bottom one, environmental refugees, could be enormous. Um, but really hard, you know, people are, talk about um, the civil war in Syria. And there have been some studies that point to, you know, one of the worst droughts preceding that which affected the food prices, you know, how do you prove that? It's very difficult to prove it, but there are people that point that out. And so could more of those types of scenarios happen? Let me show you one case study we've studied at Wisconsin, uh, looking at future temperature in the United States. And the Nelson Institute Center for Climatic Research, CCR, and, and co other colleagues have run projections for cities in eastern, the eastern US. And this is one example. This is from New York. Many, most of the cities look like what's going to happen in New York, unfortunately. If you look at this graph, um, about 13 days right now, this, this yellow line here is current climate. And so currently, there are 13 days that are 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and because this is a global hotspot, so I have to put centigrade here. <coughs> with, uh, okay, so 32 degrees centigrade, or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. There are 13 days right now, on average, in New York City, where it's that hot. 13 days of 90 degrees or hotter. But if you look at, by mid-century, according to the modeling out of Wisconsin, and this, this group is specific in looking at extreme events, and they've got one of the best tools in the world to do this. So this is some of the, this is state of the science uh, types of projections. We're looking at a tripling of 90 degree days in New York City in 40 to 50 years from now. So instead of 13 days that are that hot, 39 days. And this holds up for Milwaukee, uh, Atlanta, it was about two and a half times as many hot days. So we are going to be seeing more extreme hot days in cities. Now in other parts of the world, when you think about temperature, um, this is a model showing future summer temperatures. Uh, the top is uh, mid-century, and the bottom is by towards the end of the century. Let's just focus on this one. Everything in red has a 90% probability of having the hottest summers ever in their recorded history. And when you think about the tropics and growing food in the tropics, many crops are within a climatic envelope. So if it gets too dry, that's a problem. If it gets too wet, that's a problem. If it gets too hot, that can be a problem. The um, crop modeler on this paper published in Science predicted that because of these extreme temperatures, especially in the tropics, 
that the risk of hunger, the number of people at risk of hunger could double very soon, in a few decades, by mid-century. So when I look at this, I say that is an enormous public health threat. Now remember, this is temperature. Let's talk about the other part of climate change, because it's not just global warming, right? It's, it's climate change. It's, it's, it's really the global climate crisis, to be honest. And if you think about precipitation and extremes of the hydrologic cycle, with you know, more floods and more droughts, and hot air holding more moisture, the character of rainfall is going to change. The projection for average global rainfall is that when it rains, it will, it will pour. And if any of you are from Milwaukee, you know that the, um, you know, there was a cryptosporidiosis outbreak in the, in the 1990s. We actually analyzed that outbreak and found that that was preceded by the heaviest rainfall month in Milwaukee's 50-year record that we studied 50 years. So when it rains, that's a problem. And we over, um, it overtakes you know, the sewage and, and, and storm waters. If, storm, if you don't have separation of storm water and sewage, you get cross-contamination. You get these combined sewage overflow events, CSOs. We, we did an analysis uh, that asked the question, future climate, future rainfall for this region Chicago, and uh, specifically, what would happen with the number of combined sewage overflow events? And we found that by mid-century, Chicago could see a doubling, an increase, over, you know, 100% increase in these contamination events. So another reason why climate change through extreme rainfall uh, could be a health risk. So let's talk about something that is quite recent. Could, could climate variability, climate change, have, some, have had some role in the current Zika epidemic? Now, I put a question mark there because we are in the middle of studying this. There are a lot of people at the University of Wisconsin working on Zika across the, the campus, uh, many in the School of Veterinary Medicine, um, OBGYN, the Global Health Institute. Uh, and so right now, the Nelson Institute and the Global Health Institute are collaborating to ask the question, could Zika have, could there be other environmental contributions to Zika? So if you think about the mosquito vector, this is Aedes aegypti. It's called the small container mosquito. This mosquito is the same uh, mosquito that carries yellow fever, dengue fever, and, and Zika. And this mosquito is, um, it's, it's called the small container mosquito because it breeds in artificial containers like this. Unlike the malaria mosquito, totally different from the malaria mosquito. So if you have, you know, places like this, you know, in this type of environment, you know that this is an urban mosquito. And it does really well when you've got these types of breeding sites. And where this mosquito exists, in red and in orange, where the climate could allow it to exist, you can see that it's already in Texas and Florida. The mosquito is here. And the other thing to think about, in our study, we're asking the question, there have only been a few Zika epidemics. And so we're looking at the climate around those epidemics. But we're also asking the question, what is the closest relative to Zika virus? Dengue fever is the, has, is the, it's in the exact same virus family, it's a flavivirus, and it's carried by the same mosquito, Hades aegypti. So we're looking at um, the, some of the largest dengue fever epidemics. And this is a really important study that came out last year in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, looking at dengue fever in Southeast Asia. And what it, what it looks like is that right after some of the highest temperatures, you have your largest dengue fever epidemic. And moreover, um, this biggest epidemic back here in 1998 followed 
the strongest El Nino in history until this year. Last year, 2015, was the hottest year on record across the globe. What places on Earth experienced the hottest temperatures in their recorded history? You know, the most, you know, most of the land-based area that had the hottest temperatures, this is actually in the ocean right here. This is in the ocean right here. This is in the ocean right here. Northeast, Brazil, Colombia, parts of Venezuela, Peru. So the areas that are having Zika right now had the hottest summers, uh, had the hottest year in history. Um, they also are experiencing, this is now the biggest El Nino in history, surpassing 1997. So in, in Northeast Brazil, uh, you're having drought conditions. And if you think about what people do in drought conditions, they store water. And this is, this is a mosquito that actually does well in drier conditions because it lives in artificial containers. So we're in the middle of this analysis. We're hoping to uh, submit by the, hoping, hoping by the end of spring break, by the end of next week, uh, to submit our findings about why we think there is a major contribution. Moreover, if you add one other environmental factor that's unique to Brazil, how many of you have heard the word favela? It's, it's a Portuguese for slum. And Brazil has one of the, the world's highest Gini coefficients, meaning the difference between rich and poor. And you can, other than a few uh, you know, corrupt, uh, I don't know, that's probably what's going on there in Africa. You know, in Botswana, a huge difference between extreme rich and poor. But other than these, a couple of these African nations, Brazil has a very high Gini coefficient between rich and poor, and many of those favelas, those slum areas. So put that scenario of these exposed people living in slums, peri-urban slums, and the small breeding, small container breeding mosquito Aedes aegypti, and the extreme climate, um, I'm going to be presenting something called, is this the perfect storm for Zika? That'll be in, in our participation in the, in the Consortium of Universities for Global Health conference next, next month in San Francisco. So speaking of those favelas, there are some other dimensions of climate change, and that involves the ethical dimensions. Who are the people at most risk? in extreme storms? Who, who died in Hurricane Katrina? Who's at risk in Brazil? You know, there's an ethical dimension to climate change. And you know, Pope, Pope uh, Francis pointed this out. You can see this uh, headline in the New York Times looking at um, poverty, climate change, and immigration, top priorities. So there has been this uh, Pope Francis effect uh, in the conversation of climate change, which is very important. Uh, about the mor morality of the industrialized countries with their energy policy crippling the entire world. It's simply unethical. We actually did it, we did an analysis uh, nine years ago, and we asked the question, um, look at these maps, these are cartograms, these are data-driven maps. These are not cartoons, they're cartograms. And we asked the question, if you look on the bottom here, where are the most climate sensitive diseases like malaria, malnutrition, and diarrheal disease? And you see in sub-Saharan Africa, India, these poor countries. But which countries are changing the climate? Which countries are most responsible for today's climate change? Well, on top here, this is the, uh, a 50 year aggregate of CO2 emissions. And unfortunately, the United States is number one. You see China's pretty big, Germany. So these industrialized countries are the most responsible for climate change. And when you look at this, you know, on average, Americans emit six times 
more greenhouse gas emissions from our energy policy compared to an average global citizen, or maybe 80 to 100 times someone in a, in a poor country. So our energy policy is really quite unique. Now, granted, China has overtaken us about six years ago. China now outpollutes us. They win that distinction of being the, the biggest greenhouse gas emitter. Um, but currently, because greenhouse gases last in the atmosphere for over 50 years, we are still the number one most responsible country for, climate, for today's climate change. And again, you know, is this, is this fair? So I had the, the great honor of this, this study, this ethical dilemma was picked up, uh, and I presented in a conference uh, on environmental ethics uh, that took place in Dharamsala. And while I was showing that same map to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is a very bright person, who knows how to really focus in and pay attention, he asked the obvious question. And I'm quoting His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He said, I, he said, if you know pollution kills, your country is not showing much compassion, correct? I mean, you know, that's the Dalai Lama. He asked the right question. I said to him, listen, your holiness, you know, we didn't know that burning coal was bad for a long time, you know, until 1952 when the killer London smog event happened. Then we took the factories out of cities. We put scrubbers on smokestacks. We didn't know it was bad and harmful until all those people died in the, the, London, fog, the London smog uh, event. Okay, and then of course then we caused acid rain, and then, but we're still we cleaned up a lot of pollution. We didn't know that you, you could clean up all that pollution and still be emitting CO2 and other greenhouse gases that are disrupting the Earth's climate. We didn't know that until the late 1980s, maybe 1990, early 90s. So we didn't know. And he looked at me, he said, he said, Jonathan, it's, it's 2011 right now. And so you've known this for 20 years. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I confess that, you know, it's, it's a challenge and that we, we do know now, we now know this, that's a problem. And from the co uh, conference of the parties, you know, this is from the COP20 that fed into the Paris meeting, these national commitments that I showed you earlier, you know, we're a fossil fuel dependent society in many ways. Of course, we think we are, but in many ways we don't have to be. But to cut by 40 or 50 percent fossil fuel emissions, that's, that seems daunting, doesn't it? And if, if I want to take the Dalai Lama for his word and say, look, you know, we're being unethical, this sounds pretty hard, but we have to, to be morally correct. We really need to get here. I thought about it. And I thought, you know, look, what happens when you emit greenhouse gas emissions? When you, when you burn fossil fuel and you have all these greenhouse gas emissions, what else are you putting into the atmosphere? And I thought, you know, while those cuts seem daunting, if you put a public health perspective into this, in fact, the higher the pledge, the more you reduce fossil fuel combustion, the more health benefits and profits you may have as a country. And I would argue now, the could policy to combat climate change be cost-free? or even a net gain, thinking of the public health co-benefits. And I call them co-benefits because the policy is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to stabilize climate. But on the side, you know, you'll, you'll also, on the side of those policies, get immediate health benefits. So look at these opportunities. Eight million people die prematurely every year from air pollution. Cardiovascular risk from, from a high meat diet is uh, spreading around the world and growing. And a new statistic, more than 3 million people die prematurely from sedentary lifestyles.
from lack of physical fitness. So all of these are you know, golden opportunities if we can get to a low carbon economy, and I'll show you why. And just a reminder, indeed, you know, trends in chronic disease are on the rise. And to the extent that air pollution, poor diet, and physical fitness are the solutions, you know, getting, getting at those issues are the solutions for turning around our rising chronic disease rates. This is to show that it's both indoor and outdoor air pollution that make up those 8 million people that die every year prematurely. This is a no-brainer. Cleaning up our air is a good idea for health. Look what happened with the Atlanta Olympics. The official said, the, the, the city official said, hey, lots of athletes were, are here. We've got to cut traffic and, and reduce air pollution for the Olympics. So they did. They, they had laws. Traffic was reduced by 23%. No surprise, their pollution levels dropped. Ground level ozone fell by 28%. Oh, what happened? Less ozone smog? Oh my gosh. Asthma-related emergency room visits by children dropped by 42%. Wow. Just a little traffic calming and you get 42% reduction in childhood asthma? Now, I've been warned this is a very smart crowd, so I just want to tell you and put this statistic in. These are epidemiologists. They know that, okay, you, you guys have probably asked the question, fewer people driving, maybe they're not going to go to the emergency room, and I don't believe the 42% reduction. Well, children's emergency room visits for non-asthma did not change. So that controls for the transportation story. But this is, it's clear, you know. This is so obvious. Why would we want to keep using our atmosphere like a toilet and putting crap into it when you clean it up a little bit and you have amazing health benefits? So this is where I ask of the policymakers that are looking at only this side of the equation. They're saying, okay, to get to low carbon, a low carbon economy, and to, to pull one ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere by having renewable energy instead of dirty coal or oil or whatever, it could cost up to $30 for every ton of CO2 you're trying to avoid putting into the atmosphere. We don't want to pay that. Well, what happens when you take a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere. You burn, you burn oil, CO2, and what else? You know, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, particulate air pollution, PM 2.5. You know, if you cut fossil fuel emissions, it's not just CO2, it's all those other nasty, unhealthy pollutants. So for every ton of CO2 you remove because of all the other associated pollution, pollutants that happen when you burn fossil fuels, you can have, on average, a benefit of $200, a health benefit from avoided mortality and illness, $200. So I ask the policymakers, I say, look, this is a really tough question for you. Which number is bigger? Now, I, I gave this presentation to the state legislature a few years ago, and I was happy. I was happy that they said, oh, we hadn't thought about this side of the equation. And so, you know, I put this up as one of my, the most important messages I can give you, which is people that are making policy for us and for, you know, and, and around the world, we have to think about the downstream effects or the downwind effects. When you burn a gallon of gasoline or you burn a barrel of oil, there are these health costs that are not in the, the market, by the way. These are these external costs that nobody's paying for. You know, what industry do you know that doesn't have to pay for its, its waste? Most of them do, not fossil fuels. You burn it, it's in the air, They're, nobody's paying for it except our population through health, health and, and death. And there was a study out of MIT two years ago, actually a year and a half ago, this is directly out of the abstract. Um, 
This is looking at the U.S. energy system for a, a you know, low carbon economy, saying that the health benefits from a low carbon economy could offset the cost of clean technology anywhere from 26% to 1,050%. So in other words, the health benefit from clean energy could be up to 10 times greater in value than the upfront cost. Quickly to shift gears, I just want to mention, not only is it energy policy, but um, I don't know if you can read that in the back. I am full of greenhouse gases. Do you have a stake in it? You know, to show that, you know, if we are moving, we already have a very high meat diet in this country and other developed countries. As we move towards more and more meat in the diet, that's not, and that's not environmentally sustainable. If you look at, you know, a high meat diet, this is a carbon dioxide equivalence as far as you know, the amount of energy and environmental resources that go into a high meat diet, that's pretty high. Medium, a low meat diet, fish diet, vegetarian, vegan. So obviously a high meat diet is the most impactful on the environment. And in the United Kingdom, they did a study and asked that if, if meat consumption were, were cut in half, Greenhouse gases would be, be reduced, but also the dangerous, the unhealthy, saturated fat could fall by 40%. Another study out of Brazil showing, you know, you would reduce cardiovascular cardio, uh, disease, heart disease. So I'm not advocating a no meat diet because meat has good micronutrients, especially if you're in a poor country. But in wealthy countries, a lower meat diet is both healthy and good for the environment. And we've got some really exciting research at the University of Wisconsin. We have one student uh, working on alternative protein. And this is, um, I don't know how many of you know about, um, you know, the growing uh, trend in insects, growing insects for protein. It's actually not as bad as it sounds. And so we're trying to show that it could be safe. Protein by weight, Mealworms offer far more protein by weight than either, you know, red meat or chicken. Uh, crickets uh, offer 15% more iron than spinach, twice as much protein by weight than beef, and uh, as much vitamin B12 as salmon. So these are things we have to think outside the box as far as sustainability. And my final uh, area of a clean energy society is the urban environment. When we think about, you know, this is, this is actually from the Paris Conference, a poster I took a picture of, of these vertical gardens, you know, to have vertical gardens, you know, urban gardens and sustainable transportation. You know, that, that picture is far different from this picture where you see, you know, a neighborhood like this is designed for automobiles rather than for people. It's not promoting exercise, it's contrary to a, a livable city. And um, you know, when you think about the opportunities that we might have out of active transport, meaning by, by walking or by biking, and that includes ma uh, public transportation that's available that, so that you can walk to public transportation, 60% of Americans do not meet minimum recommended levels of exercise. Now, Madison, we are an outlier. You know, we, are, we have a very livable city. People walk and bike. Uh, we've got a good bus system here. But on average, around America, that's unbelievable. 60% don't meet exercise requirements. But we have a golden opportunity. 40% of, of trips are less than two miles or three kilometers, short car trips. So we did a study and we asked the question, you know, what would happen if in the upper Midwest region and only in the cities, not in the countryside, if you could take those short car trips and get them off the road, what would be the air quality benefit? How would pollution drop? Then we said, okay, pollution. What about, what if half of those short car trips Half are turned into bicycle trips. And because we're in the Midwest, let's just say in the summertime. 
So four months of summer, and you're biking half of those trips, what would the health benefit be? Well, we found um, that the real number is uh, 12, 1,295. So almost 1,300 lives could be saved from less pollution and from increased physical fitness in the region. And studies like this have been done uh, in other places. In Shanghai, uh, if you could convert car trips to bike trips, they're talking about you know, 40% reduction in colon cancer. In London, reductions in, in breast cancer, heart disease, and also dementia. We know how important physical fitness is. And you know, we're, you know, probably most of you in this audience are doing OK enough to have a gym membership and have some time to go to the gym, and this is great. But if you talk about the population at large, that's out of reach for most people. So if, if we could redesign and build cities for people instead of for cars and build that, that opportunity for physical fitness into a daily routine, that could be an enormous public health benefit. And for the Paris meeting, um, our team ran analysis um, and we asked, I'll just show a couple, this is for active transportation, and the question is, if, if each of those countries reach the level of active transport by walking or biking, as happens in the Netherlands, what would the benefit be? Now, in the Netherlands, about 40% of commuting is from biking and walking. So a country like um, Canada, you know, you could, you could um, avoid 175,000 disability-adjusted life years. That's an index for health, you know, disease burden, which is about 5% of their global burden of disease. So all these, you know, there's a golden opportunity for these countries if we could get to that type of bikeability. So a low carbon economy can make us healthier and can save money, you know, especially if you think about energy production, food and agricultural systems, and transportation and urban planning. And at the University of Wisconsin, um, we understand this and we're trying to take a lead in all of these areas. Uh, we have a very exciting new area called the UW University Alliance, where the university is working with city mayors. And this is a, a collective group of us, uh, Nelson Institute, Global Health Institute, um, uh, Center on Wisconsin Strategies, uh, Institute for Research on Poverty. A bunch of us are together collaborating in, through an alliance, the University Alliance, and our lead junior faculty member, Jason Vargo, just, he told me yesterday, he's been appointed as the national lead on this initiative that's actually happening across 25 universities. So we have the leader here in Wisconsin uh, looking at this area. And um, it's a timely thing. Just, I think it was two days ago, this was released, announced, report up to the president, technology and the future of cities. Uh, out of the President's uh, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Um, this is a, a, a really good place for us to be. This is a timely issue. So I just want to wrap up and tell you I have one conclusion and one message, and that is that while climate change poses risks to our health, climate change mitigation to achieve a clean energy society offers the greatest health opportunity in the 21st century. That's my humble opinion, that we are at a place, we have a golden opportunity if we can get to a low carbon economy, a clean energy society. This could be enormous in our health and well-being and even economical well-being. So thank you very much for your engagement today. All right, everyone, we have time for one or two questions. So we will be walking around with microphones, so please wait for a microphone so everyone can hear the great things you have to ask. Um, considering the countries, France and Germany, uh, 
France gets something like 70% of its baseload electricity from nuclear energy, which doesn't emit greenhouse gases. And their next door neighbor uh, advertises itself as green, but gets most of its baseload electricity from burning coal, I believe. Can you speculate on why that's so different in neighboring countries? Well, I will, I'll just say a couple things because I'm not an energy expert, but I will say, you know, regarding nuclear energy, you know, that all energy sources need to be on the table. You know, so nuclear energy, on the one hand, is clean, but on the other hand, my, my own concern, and again, I'm not the energy expert, my own concern about nuclear is the opportunity costs that they, Nuclear energy is so expensive and has, you know, to do it right and safely is such a large investment that I worry about the opportunity cost that would drive research and, and innovation away from renewables if we, you know, now I'm not saying no nuclear. I'm just saying I worry about this opportunity cost where there's so much money that goes the wrong or goes that way and steals money from other new innovations. I do have some concern about nuclear proliferation a little bit. So there, you know, nuclear is, is clean, but nuclear has some, co some other costs. Um, so that's what I would say about nuclear. I'm mo mostly worried about the opportunity cost, uh, but I'm not outright against nuclear. Other questions? Um, the opportunities that you've described seem to imply some infrastructure investment. If we look at the recent flooding in the south of the, this United States or we go back to um, Katrina, whatever, how do you see Milwaukee's cryptosporidium situations? How do you see these opportunities playing out as public policy investments? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a lot of the world in this climate change arena uh, divide adaptation to climate change that for sure is going to happen and we have to be prepared you know for higher water levels and hotter temperatures and more frequent heat waves crop you know we have to prepare that's the adaptation side and then the mitigation side is to sort of let's start at the root of the problem and reduce fossil fuel consumption and stabilize human population growth you know to me I'm a, you know I'm a health guy to me, it's all prevention. It's all a continuum. And I say that for the climate change that we know is going to happen, I'm happy that the, the UN has come up with a, this billion dollar per year minimum um, sort of safety net to help with adaptations, to help with, you know, when, when the Netherlands are, are strengthening their, their, their um, infrastructure against the seas and seawalls, Bangladesh doesn't have that, right? So I think there needs to be effort to help these disadvantaged populations and invest in adaptation. At the same time, you know, we don't want to be mopping up the floor all the time when the, the faucet is still running. So we can keep mopping up the floor, but keep burning fossil fuel and just keep mopping up the floor even more, you know? So I see you know, we have to take a multi-level approach. You know, deal with the emergencies, be prepared with heavier rainfall, you know, prepare for what we know will be climate weirding and more extremes. Even, even as the Arctic disintegrates, the Arctic is, is warming faster than any other place in the world. As the Arctic disintegrates, as University of Wisconsin researchers have shown and described the polar vortex before it happened in 2012 or 13, they show that, you know, you, you change that temperature differential as Arctic warms, the jet stream will slow down. And instead of moving like this, it's going to move like this. And you're going to get super freezing temperatures down to Georgia. And if you go to Europe or Alaska, as, as, as Atlanta is freezing, these other places will have their record hot temperatures. Even those types of things, you know, you're going to have a lot of climate disruption that we have to be prepared for. But at the same time, we need to go upstream and, and work on both mitigation and adaptation together. 
All right, we have time for one more question. I, I have the microphone. Thank you so much, Dr. Pat, for the thorough presentation. Um, on the Mapa Mundi that you showed uh, China as one of the main uh, CO2 uh, emission culprit, uh, what about if um, we take um, that total and divide it by population? And what about if we look at what China is producing and who is consuming that production and we will see who are the real culprits. Thank you. So gr great points. Um, let me deal with your, your second point first. Um, the American market for Chinese goods is part of, absolutely, part of the reason for China's, you know, big, you know, so that we are sort of contributing indirectly to China's emissions. Uh, all the more reason that if the United States doesn't take a significant leadership role, I don't know what would happen. I mean, the U.S. absolutely has to be, take the lead on this. Now, regarding the per capita emissions, um, places like Canada, Australia, Saudi Arabia, the U.S., we are just, you know, way up there as far as per person energy consumption. And, and that is ethically not, you know, not responsible at all. Um, China's argument about you know, looking at that is really important. However, the Earth, the planet Earth, doesn't care how many people live anywhere. And it's simply a matter of the aggregate amount of greenhouse gases, no matter what the population or who's doing it, it's simply we have to lower our general amount of greenhouse gases. Now, if you're going to argue fairness between China and, and the U.S., you know, the U.S. is absolutely guilty. You know, every individual here should feel that responsibility. But China, as a huge country with, you know, a billion people, that country, what counts to the atmosphere is the emissions that come out of any place. And that's why it was really a breakthrough when China switched, China was hedging and said, look, we promise that for every unit of energy, we're going to get super efficient. But because they're so big and they have a huge population, even their promise to be super efficient is not good enough. They needed to say, whatever the efficiency is, whatever we're doing, however many people, we are going to, at the end of the day, lower our greenhouse gas emissions. And that was critical, what ha that agreement that, uh, the, that, that happened with, between uh, China and the U.S. in September was very important coming into the Paris meeting. So China understands that, okay, sure, we're, we're way below per capita emissions of the U.S., but we understand the problem is a global problem, and we're not going to argue for fairness over, you know, we can't have two cars per family, you know, like you guys do, things like that. All right, thank you everyone for coming and let's give our speaker one more round of applause. We have, we have one, one last com burning comment right here. I think it's gonna be a, a follow-up comment and not a question, right, Karen? Um, no. Make it a comment. Uh, you talked about the U.S. taking a leadership role and we've heard 3,500 economists worldwide talk about the need to price carbon. And I yes. wanted to end with that proposal as a solution. Yeah, I, I just say that in, in the end, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, f fee and dividend. You know, we, we, need to, we need to pay for, just like you saw these externalities, when you burn a gallon of gasoline, you know, you hurt people that, that have to breathe the pollution. There has to be a price on that. That has to be in the market. So I would be advocating very hard for this idea of a fee on carbon, not a tax that goes to the government, but a fee and a dividend that goes back to people. I think that's something in the dialogue that you should bring up with your, your next uh, cocktail party with your uh, representative. So with that comment, thank you very much. <laughs>